Okay, so now I'm going to talk about uh, neural networks and specifically the multi-layer perceptron. Uh, in this course, I'm not going to focus much on neur neural networks. So I'm going to only to present it in theory in this lecture and then by the end of the semester talk a bit about deep learning. But there are other courses specific for uh, neural networks. So for those of you in the big data masters, there will be one course in, an, uh, in uh, learning with unstructured data, which is for deep learning. And probably for the, the computer science masters, there will also be a deep learning course next semester, although I'm not sure yet about that. So, but for this one, we're only going to cover a bit in theory uh, the neural networks. And the, ma the main uh, focus of this lecture is to show you again that idea of changing the representation of the data in order to improve classification. So let's see what is the, the perception, its ability to uh, do a linear discrimination, and then we're going to go on for the multilayer perception and how it can do non-linear non discrimination. We're going to talk about the backpropagation algorithm, which is at the core of uh, neural networks, and a bit about regularization and applications in practice. So the, the idea of the perceptron, the original idea, is based on the, the neuron, uh, which is a, a complex cell that has a set of dendrites uh, that receive input, so to speak. And then uh, in the cell body, after some threshold in the, in the stimulation of the, the dendritic extremities, it can uh, send an impulse through the axon to uh, the, the synaptic terminal and then pass on that, that signal uh, in the network. So uh, this is more or less how a, a, a neuron works. If you have a small stimulus, the membrane will start to depolarize on the side of the stimulus, but then it will again uh, repolarize and nothing will happen. But eventually, if you have too much stimulus, the membrane along the cell body and the axon will depolarize and will, will uh, propagate a wave of depolarization along the, the cell. And that's what is the, the firing of the neuron. So basically, we have uh, it, uh, a, a combination of the stimulus will result in a non-linear response. So a, a neuron will either fire with everything or not fire at all. We can simulate this uh, with a linear combination of the inputs. So basically we are summing the inputs multiplied by different weights. And then we have some non-linear function that will fire depending on the input. So this nonlinear function can be simply a threshold uh, function that will output one if the, the total linear combination is above this threshold, uh, above zero, for example, or uh, zero if not. So this, this value zero can be uh, adjusted because of this uh, constant weight here, or you can think that the value there is minus W zero. It doesn't matter where you put it. But the idea is that we can fine-tune our artificial neuron, the, the perceptron, to receive a, a linear combination of the inputs. And then if the, the weighted sum of all the inputs is above some threshold, it will fire with a value of 1. Otherwise, it will stay quiet with a value of 0. And this was the original perceptron, which was thought at the time to be a, a, a major revolution. So this was the, the 50s because we could teach machines to learn, and people thought that machines will now be able to do everything, uh, and with this simple learning rule. So basically, we have a target value. Suppose that we want to classify something based on an input vector, and the target value for one example can be 1 or 0, depending on the class it falls to, and we measure the output of the neuron and the difference between the target and the output. So if the neuron is firing correctly, this difference is zero, and we don't change anything in the weight. If the, the neuron is firing in error, so it's giving a one when it should be a zero, or vice versa, then we multiply that difference for, by the value of each input. We multiply by a small constant, just to, so that learning is not in very large steps and things converge. And this is what we use to update each weight for, uh, for each input. So here, input 1 is, is multiplied by weight 1, input 2 by weight 2, and so forth. So we multiply the error by each input and use that value to update the corresponding weight. And we do that for all the weights. So basically, when the, the perceptron is giving the incorrect result, we are uh, changing slightly the weights to encourage the correct result. 
If it gives the correct result, we don't do anything. So one problem with this is that this only works for a single perception, and since this uh, uh, function is uh, 0 or 1, we cannot then chain perceptions in a network and propagate the error because we don't have derivatives, and so this was a, a limitation uh, to uh, put the original perceptions into networks. We can uh, solve that by instead of using this function here, that is either 0 or 1, we use a function like this, for example. Actually, nowadays, it, it, the, the actual functions that are used, uh, rectified linear units, are a bit stranger. They, they look like an elbow. But this uh, is better to explain because we can understand the, the idea. Uh, so we use the same sigmoid curve that we saw in logistic regression. This is, uh, uh, the derivative is continuous, so we can compute the, the derivative of the error and try to minimize even if we have several layers of, of neurons. So, strictly speaking, the perceptron, uh, the original perceptron from 1957, used this activation function and this learning rule. But when we talk about multilayer perceptrons, uh, we are abusing a bit the term, and we are generally considering neurons with functions like these, or uh, uh, different functions, but which has the, uh, have uh, these, uh, these properties of being a bit more well-behaved and that we can use to uh, propagate the error. So we will not worry about the name, just call uh, these neurons perceptrons, and now let's see what we can do with one of them. So let's suppose that we have one neuron that takes uh, uh, this input here. Uh, sum, uh, each input is multiplied by a weight, everything is summed, and then we use the sigmoid function here. So you can see immediately that this is like logistic regression, because logistic regression, we have this vector of parameters that is multiplied by the input, and we feed that into the logistic function. So actually, this is what we're doing here with uh, one neuron. One neuron behaves like logistic regression. Uh, so we can use that to, to classify linearly separable sets. You could, we could use logistic regression, for example, to, to separate this blue circle from the red one. This is uh, uh, as if we were simulating the R function. So 0 or 0 is 0, or false or false is false. True or true, true or false, false or true, all of these are true. So these are ones or true, this is false. Uh, this is a classic example, the, the R function. We can, uh, as the, the target function that we're trying to minimize, we are going to minimize the quadratic error between the, what the class should be, the class can be 0 or 1, and what the output of our neuron is. So F there is the output of our neuron for uh, example J, and uh, T is the target value for example J. So we're going to feed in lots of examples and try to minimize uh, this function. Uh, so this is similar to the perception, but we are now going to adjust weight according to the, uh, the, this error function here, the quadratic error function. So what can we do to train the, the net or train the neuron and try to minimize the function? We can look at the gradient of the error function and go down that gradient. We saw this gradient descent, the, the way uh, these minimization algorithms work. So how can we compute the gradient of the error function with respect to the weight? Remember that what we are trying to adjust here are these weights. But the error is measured after the activation, between the activation and the target value. So in order to do that, we need to use the train rule of the derivatives to uh, write the deri derivative of the error with respect to the weight. So we want the negative of that because this tells us where the error uh, surface is going down. Uh, and this would be the derivative of the error with respect to the output of the neuron, which is the quadratic error. So the derivative of this is this minus the target minus x. Then we need the derivative of the output of the neuron as a function of what entered of the sum, uh, the weighted sum of all the inputs. So this is the derivative of the logistic function, and we of this sigmoid function, and we compute the derivative, that one. 
and then we need the derivative uh, of the, that sum of weights with respect to the weights we are trying to update. So this is the sum, so it's just uh, all the other terms are irrelevant, we just keep the input which is the value that is multiplying by the weight. So these are all these derivatives, when we multiply everything we get this uh, learning function. So we have here the derivative of the error, the derivative of the, the uh, sigmoid function, and then the derivative of the sum. And if we multiply this by a small learning rate, this uh, at the value, we give a small step in the direction of descending the, the error surface. So we improve a bit the error of our uh, neuron. So the, the intuition for this formula is basically this one. We are, pro we are computing the derivatives in this step, the difference between the output and the target value, and then the derivative along the uh, sigmoid function, and then the derivative with respect to the weights that we're trying to adjust. So how do we do this now? We present one example to uh, our neuron. We compute the negative of the derivative of the error with respect to the input, and this gives us a direction where we can go to decrease the error. So we give a small step in that direction, not a large one because then things don't converge, but that's why we use this at the value here, the learning rate, that can be uh, a small value. And then we change, sorry, going the wrong way, we change the weights according to that learning rule, and we present a new example. Now we have a new direction, and we go down a bit, and we keep doing this uh, with examples in random order. So this is why this is stochastic gradient descent. We are doing a gradient descent like we saw for, uh, for the other uh, cases, for logistic regression and so on, but we are doing this uh, randomly by presenting different examples at random, and so changing slightly the direction in each case. This is good because uh, it helps uh, avoid getting stuck in local optima and allows the neuron to learn better, especially the case when we complicate things with uh, a larger network. But it's also a bit different from what we saw in uh, logistic regression in that in neural networks in general we don't have the optimum value. We just keep going down until things don't improve much and we give up. So we're not sure this is the optimum but it's just where, where things stop. Okay. But one way of avoiding getting stuck too early is to randomize the order of the examples and do this stochastic uh, gradient instead. We can improve a bit the speed of the computations by, instead of changing our neuron weight for each example, we give it several examples in a batch, for example 32 or 64, 64 something like that, and then we uh, add all the, the corrections for the weight and then do the corrections in one go, because that will uh, save us time updating all the weights in the network while we give uh, uh, several examples and also allows us to average out the effect of uh, those examples. But basically there is a trade-off here. If you use very large batches, you get poorer uh, performance in learning because you're averaging too much. If you use very small batches, then things take longer because you're, you're updating too, uh, too frequently the, the network. <coughs> so let's see what happens when we try to train our neuron to classify this data set. These are different trajectories, so I'm plotting the error uh, we have for different epochs. One epoch is one pass over all the data sets. So this data set only has four points. Uh, one epoch is very, very fast, very uh, small number of examples. And in each epoch we randomize the, the order of the points, we pass each of them, and then we go back to the beginning and repeat that. So, after 500 epochs, we already have the error down here, then we keep doing, and this is for 2,000 epochs. So 2,000 passes of these four points in random order in each epoch, and we get most, the trajectories are all very similar, and uh, uh, the neuron seems to learn to correctly classify this data set. Now, if we go for the exclusive OR function, so the exclusive OR, when both inputs are true, it gives a false result. Uh, this is a classical example of something that is not linearly separable because there is no straight line that we can use to separate the, the red from the blue. 
And if we try to train our neuron to do this, and this was a, the disappointing result of the perceptron, uh, it doesn't learn anything. So you, you can see that the error, the quadratic error is at 0 0.25, which is the square of 0 0.5. So basically, it's doing a, an average error of 0 0.5 and uh, missing the classification because there is no way it can correctly classify all these points. So it doesn't learn anything useful. Uh, so this was the problem with the original perceptron. It seemed that we had created intelligent machines, but after all, all they can do is linear classification and we cannot do more than that with one euro. No matter how many weights we use, it's always a linear classifier like logistic regression. So now we go for the multilayer perceptron, and this is what uh, we can get when we stack layers of neurons that are fully connected to the, the following layer. So this one can be used to uh, solve the exclusive R problem. We have one hidden layer here formed by two neurons. They receive from the input layer the, the input values, and they feed into one additional neuron. So our network has these three neurons that we can uh, adjust the way it's part. Yes? Can you solve this problem without uh, a layer but in your um, Two neurons, but how, how do you classify with two neurons? Because you only have two classes. Okay. If you use two neurons... Yeah, but for, for this case, uh, if you only have one layer, then you need to, uh, each neuron is only doing a linear uh, classification. Um, what you do here is the, the non-linearity comes from the, the hidden layer. But if you have several output neurons and only two classes, then you need to find a function to choose the class. And that one may potentially give you the non-linearity extra that you need. Yes, okay, imagine that you have four neurons, one is doing this, one is doing that, one is doing that, one is doing that. Okay. But now you need something to put everything together, and that's the, the extra neuron there, okay. So, we use uh, one, two neurons for the hidden layer. This is called the hidden layer because we don't see the output of these neurons, but they feed into the output neuron, and this one will tell us whether it's red or blue, uh, the two classes. So this is a multi-layer perceptron because it's fully connected. Each layer is fully connected to the next layer. Uh, it's feed forward, so all the connections go in the same direction until the end. Uh, you, we have the input layer, which is just where we put the input uh, values. And uh, then the hidden layer or hidden layers are those that, whose outputs are not visible. And then we have one output layer at the end. These ones here serve as the bias uh, value. So if we go to the, the original uh, specification here of the perceptron, you see that we have this W0 here. So we have all the weight and then an additional weight outside the vector. This is the same kind of trick that we saw before that we can, instead of having that additional weights hanging out in the formula, we can put everything in the same vector if we add one to the input. Because now this one is just multiplying by the additional weight and this works as an independent uh, bias value. So this represents the additional weight, this error, I this error here uh, that is just being multiplied by one. So how can we train the multilayer perceptron? The update rule for adjusting the weights of the output neuron is the same as if it was a single neuron. The only difference is that instead of receiving the input uh, from the data, it's receiving the input from the output of the previous layer. So this is the same thing. We do the derivatives of the error, the, the logistic function, the, sum, the weighted sum of all the inputs, but the inputs are not the x values are the output, the S, or the sigmoid function of the previous layer neuron. So this output uh, neuron is learning based on what it received from the previous neuron. So this is the same thing, and we can uh, call this part here, so everything that we are computing before multiplying by the value that is coming into the neuron, we call this the delta. 
So this is the derivative of the quadratic error, the derivative of the uh, sigmoid function, and then this is what is multiplied by this. So these two derivatives we call the delta, and we uh, can simplify the expression in this way. Now, where things get a bit more complicated is when we go to the hidden layer. Because now we need to backpropagate the error from the, the end through the layers ahead into the hidden layer. So what we need to do is to continue doing this. We have the, the error of the output, uh, the output of the output layer, the uh, derivative for the weighted sum in the output layer, the derivative for the, the uh, weight or the values that are inputting into the output layer multiplied by this weight, and then we, can, we need to continue that through the logistic function of the hidden layer and all the way to the weight of the hidden layer. But since potentially one, uh, one hidden layer neuron could actually be feeding more than one neuron uh, in, the, in the layer ahead. In our case, we only have three neurons and it's a very simple network, but with a, more, a larger network this could happen. We need to do this for all the neurons that are ahead. So we need to uh, gather, to sum up, the error that is coming from all the neurons ahead. And this is what we are summing here. So we can again call this the delta. Delta is all these derivatives uh, that are then being multiplied by what is passing, by the input passing through this uh, uh, layer. So this is basically the backpropagation algorithm. Uh, we can get, uh, get an intuitive notion here that we present an example, we activate the network going forward, and now we are backpropagating the error. We have this neuron should have output to the target value. There is a difference between its output and the target. We propagate the derivative, or we co compute the derivative of that error, multiply by the derivative of the sigmoid function, the, the weight that is passing here, then the derivative of this sigmoid function, and all the way to the weight that we're going to uh, update. So this is the backpropagation algorithm because we keep propagating the error backwards through the network and updating all the weights, regardless of how many layers we have. We just keep propagating backwards. So first, we uh, propagate the activation of the network forward through all the layers. Then we compute the delta for the output layer. Then we go back in, uh, along the network, computing the delta for all the previous <coughs> layers. And then we update all the weights uh, with all those uh, differences that we compute, the adjustments for the weight. <coughs> So, how can we solve the, pro the uh, exclusive R problem using one hidden layer? You can see here that uh, we now need more uh, epochs. I'm going all the way to 20,000. So it takes a bit to learn, to restructure everything. Some trajectories take longer than others, but most eventually manage to learn, and we have this classification. So these are the blue examples and the red examples. How can the, the last neuron distinguish these two? Because each neuron is only doing a linear uh, classification. The thing is that when we look at what happens in the hidden layer, so this is the output of the hidden layer, uh, one of the neurons of the hidden layer here, one, the other over here, and we can see that this neuron on the hidden layer manages to put this red example here, then the two blue ones, and then the red lower. So if you project everything on this axis, which is one of the neurons, it cannot separate red from blue, because it has red, then blue, then red below. One neuron cannot solve this problem. The same thing happens for the other neuron in the hidden layer. It has red here, then the two blues, then another red over there. But when the output neuron is looking at the input it's receiving from the two previous neurons, it's looking at a linearly separable problem, because now all it needs is to draw a line here and separate blue from red. So what's happening in the, in the neural network is similar to what we saw with logistic regression when we projected the data with a nonlinear transformation and we bent the data. Now the network is learning how to bend the data so that the output neuron can classify things properly. And what the hidden layer is doing is basically changing the data so that it, it's easier to classify by the output neuron and it becomes linearly classifiable. 
So we're not going to uh, use uh, uh, neural networks here in this course, but this is just to give you another example of this idea of transforming the data non-linearly in order to be able to solve the problem. And this is why we need a non-linear function in the activation of each neuron, because if this was just linear transformations, it wouldn't help us, we would get the same thing. It would just be uh, the equivalent of a singular linear transformation. Now, other things that we can do with the um, neural network, uh, this was called auto-associator uh, in the time of Mitchell and in the 90s and so on. Nowadays, it's known as an autoencoder and it's part of a, of a large group of, of neural networks. But this is an example where we can do unsupervised learning. So, instead of having labels, we feed the network the inputs and we want the network to output the same thing we gave it. So this was Mitchell's example. The inputs, there are eight inputs. One of them will be one and the other zero. So it can be one with all zeros or zero, one, zeros, zero, zero, one, zeros, and so on. So there are eight possible inputs here. And we demand that the network output exactly the same thing. If there is a one here and all of these are zeros, there must be a one there and all of these must be zeros, and so forth. But in the hidden layer, the network only has three neurons. So it has to represent all the eight different combinations using only three neurons in the hidden layer. And what happens in this case, if we train the network, for example, these are the eight different examples, eventually the error rate goes down, so the network is able to reproduce in the output the same pattern it received in the input. But when we look at what happens in the three hidden layers, we see that th uh, they have all the different eight combinations of writing eight in binary. They are not necessarily in the same order, but they are all the different combinations. So uh, our uh, network learned to encode this input in a more compact form in the hidden layer. And this is why these are called autoencoders. There are many different uh, ways of doing this, but the idea is that you, don't, you are not restricted with neural networks just to do classification or regression. You can also do this kind of representation learning with unsupervised data where you don't have labels and just learn the structure of the data. So, in practice, uh, we should usually uh, use values close to zero, especially if you're using functions like this one, because away from zero, these tend to saturate quickly. So, the, the values for the weight should be close to zero, and our data should be standardized or normalized so that it's not very far from zero. Okay. Uh, another important thing to bear in mind when dealing with neural networks is that we are doing stochastic gradient descent, so each time we train the network we can get a slightly different uh, trajectory on the error, and also we get a different network, different actual weights there. Uh, so standardization or normalization is important to keep scaling. Since uh, I this is only for the basic uh, version, so to speak, if we are using one learning rate for all the, uh, the weights, then everything should be in the same scale. If we input the network with some inputs that go in the thousands and others that go in the units or tens or something like that, then these different uh, scales will perform badly when we apply the same learning rate to all the, the weights. So it's important to keep everything in the same scale in this case. Okay? Uh, we can easily use a uh, uh, neural network for binary classification because we can use the, out the final neuron just like in logistic regression if it's high it's one class, if it's low it's the other one if we want to, to learn different, uh, a larger number of classes we can have several output neurons and then use the function like softmax or something like that to convert that into the probability of belonging to each class so it's easy with a neural network to go from binary classification to a uh, multi-class problem. Uh, <coughs> there are some terms that you'll probably find when looking at neural networks in the stochastic gradient descent. One epoch is one path through all the, the examples, and typically you have to do several passes or hundreds or thousands of passes through all the examples. One batch is uh, one set of examples that you feed into a network that you use to compute the adjustments to the weights, but you don't actually adjust the weights until you add all the corrections for that batch. So uh, using batch uh, 
uh, batches in training neural networks can speed up training because it takes less computations. You're not always adjusting the weight. So basically, we are going to repeat this until the error uh, is as low as possible, or we can do regularization by terminating the training before uh, uh, the error, the validation error uh, becomes too bad. So this is uh, one way of preventing overfitting in neural networks. Remember that the idea of regularization is to change how we train the model in order to try to reduce overfitting. When we start training the, the network, we start uh, uh, fixing the, uh, changing the weights, and at some point the network may start to be too, too much adjusted to the training set and lose the ability to generalize. We can check that if we use cross-validation or if we have a validation set and we keep measuring the error on the validation set. Yes? Yes, overfit. The network can overfit because the network can have many parameters and start learning details of the training set that do not generalize. So this is what happens here. If you see the training error keeps reducing, so I, I ran this several times, the training error keeps going down uh, on these uh, examples. But the validation error sometimes starts increasing. This means that after about this point, about 30 epochs or something like that, the network is starting to overfeed. It's learning too many, de many details on the training set that do not generalize. So even though the training error keeps reducing, it's best to stop training at this point and avoid uh, overfeeding the, the network. So this is one way of doing regularization with neural networks is early stop. We stop uh, when the validation error starts to increase. Another way of doing regularization is weight decay. So uh, aside from the update rule that takes the derivative of the error to change the weight, we also reduce the size of the weight by uh, one fraction. This means that some weights on the network that are not important for the classification problem, they tend to shrink to zero. It's something similar to what we were doing with the uh, linear regression, for example, or logistic regression, try to keep the, the, the weight vector small. So we can use that kind of regularization, L1, L2, and so forth. We can use that in a, a neural network. So to sum up, uh, we are not going to detail uh, neural networks here. The idea is just to give you the notion of backpropagation and also, especially, another example of how data is transformed inside the classifier in order to overcome the problem of classifying nonlinear data. This will be again important next week when we look at the kernel trick in support vector machines. So we saw stochastic layer descent, this using several layers and backpropagation. If you want to, uh, Mitchell's book is a bit old, uh, but the explanation of backpropagation there is, I think, is very easy to follow. You have the pseudocode and it's very easy to understand. If you look at the neural networks in Alpidan's book, be careful that the, uh, Alpidan is assuming that the output is linear. So this last, the, the error derivative at the end, the formula is slightly different because you don't have the logistic activation at the end. Also, note that there are many different activation functions for the neurons, so the derivative of the error depends on the activation function. Okay?